I just want to um, thank you ladies for coming tonight. Thank you for, for being here and I appreciate it. Um, first thing that I want to tell you is that I don't do vulnerable very well. Um, that's not something that I do very well at all. And so this whole year has been nothing but sheer vulnerability. Okay? But I'll give you a little bit of a backstory since not everybody knows uh, our story. Um, I'm going to go through some pictures as we go through. So as I say, next slide, next slide, please. You know, you'll understand what I'm doing. So uh, my husband and I were married in um, November of 2009. It was my first marriage. I had never cohabitated with a man. This was the first foray into anything like this, um, and I was 40. So it was, uh, it was a learning curve. So, but it was it was a really it was a fun marriage. We really had a lot of fun. We, we did a lot of things and we traveled a lot of places and we, enjoyed, we genuinely enjoyed each other's company. Um, so it was, um, it, was, it was good to be married to a fun particular, this particular person who was really fun. Um, and he had two sons already. His first wife had passed away. Um, and so left, left him to raise uh, an 11-year-old son. And then he had a, a son that was much older um, from another relationship. So I was, I was swept up into a family immediately. And I was, I was blessed to be able to do that. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. So these are, um, these are his two sons with him. Elijah is in the middle, and Justin is on the outside right. Um, next slide, please. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that's, okay. yeah, that's yes. him. <laughs> if there was ever to be oh. a picture that embodied yes. who my husband was, that's Lester Stanley right there. Um, he was gregarious. He was he loved to laugh and laughed loudly. <laughs> um, and he was he loved to joke and love to make fun of other people. Um, <laughs> it's just his personality. Oh, we'll to cap on people all the time, but um, that, that was who he was. Um, next slide, please. Um, as you can tell, um, weight loss was a struggle for both of us. And um, that was actually in this sanctuary. Yes. Uh, it's that wall over there. Yes, and that was um, January of 2017. Yeah, and I was at my heaviest, and I'm not going to tell you how heavy I was, but um, that was that was my heaviest I think that I had ever reached, and um, it got to the point where um, Lester's uh, Lester's health became greatly impacted by his weight and by by everything that he had been carrying, because he had actually diabetes for, I think he told me, 20 years that he pretty much ignored. Um, and at the time that we decided to do anything about it, um, he had neuropathy, which means that he had a lot of nerve damage in his, in his feet and hands. Um, and so he was, he was falling and tripping. He was um, having really horrible pains in his feet. And so the quality of his life had greatly diminished. So uh, we got a mailer in the mail and he decided that he wanted to try this therapy that was being offered. So we talked about it a lot, but it would mean a lot of changes. Next slide, please. This was up in San Francisco just before we started the program. Next slide, please. And again. Those are our two dogs, by the way, Sandy and Sophie. And then one more time. Thank you. So this was the weekend before we started his treatment. And boy, did we have fun. We did <laughs> in and out. We went to Morton's. We went headfirst into an eating binge. But we decided that this was going to be the last thing that we would ever do. And that we were going to change our lives dramatically after that. So what we did, at this point, his, his uh, A1C was at a 10.7. Wow. Yeah. So for those that know diabetes, you know that that's pretty much off the charts. Um, 
uh, normal should be, well, a person with diabetes should be like a 6.2. Um, and so uh, he was well above what he should have. Uh, he was actually living a double life, going to 7-Eleven and buying candy bars, which I caught him in that <laughs> scenario. So um, we had a reckoning at the doctor's office, and so we decided that we would start to eat a, a different lifestyle. It was called paleo lifestyle. And so what ended up happening was we started shedding the weight. Um, his, his, uh, the treatment that he was receiving for his, his feet and hands actually regenerated those nerves. So they were no longer misfiring. They had a, a place for that electri electrical current to go. And so there was no more pain that he was experiencing. Praise God. And it was just God opening up doors for that to happen. So his, his level of happiness raised tremendously because of the ability to go places and to do more things. It really brought another quality of life that we hadn't had in, in, in our marriage. And so it opened up doors for us to do more things. Next slide, please. And so that was here um, as we were on our journey. We had just started, and again. And this was his graduation day. He was one happy camper, right? So he was done with the therapies um, that were required of him. But it meant that we could not deviate from the paleo eating plan. We had to stay on it um, in order to have the treatments that he had received to actually stay and to actually be effective for the rest of his life. So there was no going back. Um, did we feel like falling off the wagon? You betcha. Were there plates of cookies that would go right in front of us that we would maybe sniff as they went by? Absolutely. But we stayed, we stayed true to the course but that was what we needed to do. So uh, all in all, he lost 60 pounds and I lost 120. Wow. Yeah, so it was, it was quite incredible. There would be days that we would go to the gym when we first started and we would look at each other as we pulled into the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> we would pull into the parking lot, look at each other and say, well, does that count? <laughs> That was 2017, March of 2017 that we started that. So over the course of the year, our endurance gradually grew. So we were able to actually stay and go in the building. And, <laughs> um, and it was great. I had a, had a fabulous exercise partner. We would spot each other. We would encourage each other. Um, and it was, it was a good bonding time for us to be together, going through this journey together. We truly did lean on one another for this. So it was, it was good. It was a, a really good thing for both of us. Um, we were much more active. We were, we were hiking. We were starting to hike. Um, we were starting to go camping, which, you know, for him, camping was going into a camper. And, uh, <laughs> and camping that thing. And I'm like, no, no, no. It's tent camping that we need to do. So um, praise God he saw my way. <laughs> so, we got ourselves a tent and we started camping. And it was really, really, it was phenomenal. We also, um, we also went biking, all these different things that we were able to do, go on walks together, um, and it was wonderful. And then we decided, well, maybe we should just go to Ireland. There's a story behind that too. Um, <clears throat> he had brought up this harebrained scheme, wouldn't it be great to see Rent Collective which is one of our favorite bands, yeah. in their native Ireland. Uh, one week later, they released their concert schedule, and voila, their last concert date was in Dublin, Ireland. So I said, guess where we're going <laughs> next year. So we decided to, uh, to go to Ireland to see them in Ireland. And it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. We did see them. They were amazing, and it was in a nice, um, intimate setting, you know, not a big theater at all. It was just fabulous. Um, go ahead with the next slide, please. And again. And again. And that was that was the collage of us in Ireland. Um, we we got to see castles. Um, 
he was, he had a really good time. He had never left the country, so this was a big deal for him. He really didn't travel a whole lot um, before I had met him, so this was, this was a big, big, big deal for him, and he really enjoyed it. And for all of the, the things that are so different over in, in Europe, there were things that he really enjoyed, like the bacon. He really enjoyed the bacon, um, which was quite delicious. It will change your life. But, um, but he, we also enjoyed just being in a different area, in a different culture. And the, and the people were just so friendly. Um, and one thing that he had said to me was, um, what if we liked it so much that we don't come back? Oh. Not knowing how prophetic that was. Um, so what ended up happening was he ended up collapsing. Um, we had left Dublin um, that morning um, on the 22nd of May, and he collapsed as we were getting ready just to go to bed that evening. Um, we were in the central island so we were in County Roscommon, and we had driven, which was the first time that we'd ever driven. Um, that was an experience and a half. Um, and we, we were just settling down. We, he had a video call. We had a video call with Elijah uh, at home that earlier that morning, well, Elijah's morning, um, more our afternoon. And he just collapsed. He never regained consciousness. And he ended up going to two separate hospitals. The first one was Mullingar, which was 45 minutes away from where we were. It took them 90 minutes to get to him. And while they're getting to him, mind you, um, I have a full tea service set in front of me and women around me that I don't even know because I'm, I'm the only older one there. And they're holding my hand. They're crying with me and serving me tea while, they're, while I have other men that are performing CPR. Finally, EMTs get there. They're able to stabilize him after a good 45 minutes. And then they get him on the, the ambulance to get him to uh, the first hospital. When they got him into the ER and they called me back to see him, I just knew. I just knew that he wasn't going to make it. It was just the pit in my stomach. And when I looked at him, and I looked over him, and I said to him, if you need to go, I release you. Wow. I knew where he was going to go. I knew who he was going to be at the feet of. Amen. So I had no, I had no qualms in releasing him. Because it wouldn't be about me at that point. You know, it's, it's got to be about him. So, um, so they, they decided to send him back to Dublin to, to a specialist, uh, to a team of specialists in that hospital, in a different hospital. Um, <clears throat> because they thought that there was some viability to him, that, that his brain had actually survived all of that trauma. Um, so they, they trucked him back to, to Dublin. Um, I had hospital staff that, that put me in a cab, and I actually got to the hospital in Dublin before he did. They paid for the cab. The cab driver did nothing but just was able to was able to have conversation with me that took my mind off of the tragedy that was happening. Mm -hmm. And as I'm sitting there outside of the coronary care unit, and I'm slumped over <laughs> the bag that I had with me, my own knapsack that I was able to hurriedly get together, I was wondering, where, what's, where is this all going to go? How is this all going to go? And I had two scenarios that I was running in my head. One was, okay, he makes it. How long is it going to be? Am I, am I going to be in Ireland with him? How long is it going to be before he can come home with me? 
And the other scenario was, what am I going to do when he doesn't make it? How am I going to be able to get him back to the States? So those were two things that I was logistically going through. But you have to know, that's where my head is all the time. I'm a problem solver by nature. So I pushed back a lot of feelings, and I was trying to work through the problem rather than feel the feelings. But I guess in those conditions, you kind of have to, right? So God gave me the strength to get through that. So he got into the, to the coronary care unit. I met with uh, the doctor who gave me the rundown, who told me that my husband didn't belong to me anymore. He was pretty much the ward of, of Ireland now, so he would be making decisions about my husband's care. Wow. That is typical. That is typical. That is typical. However, I must add that this that this doctor was more than compassionate, more than caring, and was even sprouting tears while he was telling me this. And he told me, he said, I will not do anything without consulting with you first. So even though they had the full right to do everything without my consent, they were very, very, very compassionate. Wow. So, some of the things that happened was, um, as we're getting closer, and the doctor finally makes the call that this is just not going to work, that whatever my husband has sustained, whatever damage my husband had sustained during that time, was not reversible. And so his prognosis was very grim. And I had waited during tests, I had seen them taking down the IV uh, fluids, and I knew in my head, this is it, We're gonna, I'm going to have that conversation with the doctor. And he was the head of the cardiac unit. So when he came in, he sat down, and he sat down knee to knee with me, and he had tears in his eyes, and he told me exactly what was going to happen and how he would not make it through. And it was something that I didn't want to hear because it, it just confirmed everything that I knew But God. Amen? They had family rooms for me that I could stay in, so I never had to leave the campus of the hospital. He had total care from the nurses and from all of the hospital staff. There weren't a ward. And in the ICUs there, you don't get your own room. It's a ward. And he was the ninth bed. And that ninth bed was right in front of the nursing station. So there were eyes on him the whole time. He never was ever neglected. He never ever got mistreated. And all of the nursing staff and all of the hospital staff were nothing but kind and wonderful. I had more tea than I knew what to do with. <laughs> They fed me, they gave me tea, and they cared for me in the last moments of my husband being here on earth. They held me while I, while I cried. And it was just amazing. The Irish people, if there was ever a place for my husband to go, <laughs> it was the perfect place for him to go. We were loved on completely. And God just did nothing more but to give me love to people, truly. So, also during all of this, I had, um, I had one of the uh, hospital staff call the embassy, and the embassy got in touch with the Irish Tourist Assistance Service, ITAS, and they were able to get in touch with me and follow up with me. During this time, however, after my husband had gone to be with Jesus, I was in a I was alone in a, in a hospital room, like an isolation room that they would have for people. There was nobody else in there, and just it was just so stark and barren. But that's how I felt inside. It was just the manifestation of what was going on. I, I wasn't a wife anymore. I was homeless at this point, because I can't stay at the hospital anymore, so I got to go. <laughs> I got to pick up and go. But I had nowhere to go. What do I do? They gave me a sheet of places where I could, I could call. And it was a list of hotels in the area. 
189 euro a night to start. If they had openings. If not, then sorry, you're out of luck. And most of them, I was out of luck. But God. I said to him, Lord, there's, there's nothing else I can do. And I'm a person here in the States that I can, I can, I can certainly navigate through any system, and I can talk to people, and I can get things done here. But nothing that I could do could get anything done there but God. Truly. He's the one that, st that stood in for me. He's the one that opened up the doors. I TAS was able to get in touch with a woman that does um, intervention services with them. And so she does a lot of, um, a lot of uh, going in and, and doing a lot of, um, if, if someone is in the middle of a crisis, she's able to come in and scoop them up and, and help them navigate through the system. Well, she was the one that had openings at her bed and breakfast. Wow. That is unlisted. Wow. Wow. 35 euro a night. Mm -hmm. oh and a house setting. Because guess what? Next slide, please. That was our last selfie together in Dublin. These two boys came to be with me in Ireland. So I needed a place for them to be. And also my, my uh, oldest brother-in-law also came. Lester's oldest brother came. But these guys showed up. And it was amazing. And I was so blessed that they were there. But I needed a place. And nothing I could do would, would, was able to, to do that for me. But God. God showed up tremendously. So not only that. But as I, was, as I was needing to prepare to leave, because I had to think about all the logistics at that point, what we were going to do, I had to have my husband cremated on his birthday, um, his 60th birthday, more or less. Um, how is this all going to work? I needed to get a death certificate. I needed to get documentation to get him out of the country. In ashes, but to get him out of the country. And so I had to literally go down to an office, the registration office, where you register your deaths and births. And I had to register his death on the day of his death. So here I am, two suitcases, two, uh, one uh, backpack as I had already uh, consolidated. But I'm walking into this office, and this woman's looking at me. And she says, are you moving in? I said, no, I'm trying to leave. And when I told her what I was there for and what had transpired that day, she nearly came over the, the counter. <laughs> Just a love on me. And she sat with me and she said, you sit over there and I will come to you and we will get the paperwork done. And she did. And she sat with me and she cried with me. This beautiful person that I didn't even know. And I was sitting there, and I was, as I was waiting to talk to the, the final person to get everything finalized for the death certificate, the enemy was playing with me. Because in Dublin, there's a lot of bars. <laughs> and in my former days, I did like my Irish stats. So I could hear the activity across the street. The enemy was playing with me. You don't need... Need to, you don't need to go to the to the B and B right now. You know, you can just have a have a beer or two, and nobody will ever know. And you don't have to stay on that paleo plan anymore. You don't have to do any of that. So I was I was actually in the in a struggle, and some might say even in a struggle for my life, because I had to make decisions. Who was I going to follow? Was I going to follow my flesh? Was I going to follow my feelings, or was I going to follow God? God made the decision for me when he sent the cap. <laughs> there was a cap that, that was, was sent oh, for me. Oh, you said a cow. No, no, a cab. <laughs> a, a taxi that was sent Thank for me you. <laughs> to take me to my bed and breakfast. Wow. Praise God. Okay. Wow. 
once again, Amen. he swooped me up and he rescued me. He is my deliverer. Amen. He is my healer. Amen. Amen. So when I got home, um, oh, and the other the other thing is is that um, I was also blessed um, because the, the B and B that I stayed at right across the way was um, a gentleman that worked high up in Aer Lingus, which was the airline that I was flying out of. And so he uh, was given all of my information, and he actually got me booted up to business class. Mm -hmm. So I was able to, to fly out of the fray of everybody because my husband's seat would have been right next to me, empty, wow. coming home. Mm -hmm. But God. But God. Amen? Amen. He is amazing. So when I got home, God was so good to surround me with people that just loved on me and would not let go. Would get in my face, <laughs> would call me, would text me, would not, would not let me go into places that were, that were dark. And I could easily have done that. Um, I, have a, I have fought with depression in the past, so it's a very comfortable place for me to be. But that's not where I was meant to be. Amen. Amen. So my life completely changed in an instant. And literally, I had to choose how. Because um, back in 1987, I lost um, my older brother at that point. He was five years older in a horrific car accident. And I walked away from God at that point. So I know what it's like to wander in the desert for 17 years without him. Finding everything else to fill that God-shaped hole that only he can fill. And it does exist, I promise you, it does exist. But that was, I, I refuse to do that ever again. Next slide, please. So on July 6th of last year, I adopted my stepson. Yeah. And, um, go ahead with the next slide. And we were extremely, extremely thrilled. Next slide, please. I never knew that I could adopt someone that of that age because he was uh, 21 at the time. And But it was interesting, God put a seed way back a few months, but even before that, when my husband was still alive, I had talked with someone that was talking about how she had adopted someone older. So God called it back up into my memory. And so I was able to do that, praise God. So now he is my full-fledged son. Wow. Um, I am so, so blessed by that. And he is no longer an orphan. Amen. Mm -hmm. However, I had, a, I had a lot of difficulty in adjusting to my new life. I had a loss of a husband. I lost my best friend. I lost my workout partner, um, and lost the future that I knew that I knew of it. We had plans. We had plans. We were going to do things. We were going to we were going to do some stuff together. And now all that was out the window. What was I going to do? So I was having hissy fits before God. I'll be honest. Um, I would scream and cry, and I'd feel bad for my next door neighbors, because I really do feel that sometimes they probably should have called the cops, because it probably sounded like someone was being murdered. I was unhinged, but I was unhinged before God. And I poured out my heart. You know how I said I don't do vulnerable? Well, that all changed, because I had to do vulnerable with God. I had to open up. I had to tell him how I felt. I had to tell him what was going on with me because only through the pouring out could I have him pour back into me. Right. So I had to get all of that out in order for him to fill me in. Praise God. July 16th, um, God gave me 1 Timothy 4, 13 through 16. Can I have someone read that for me? It's 1 Timothy 4. Thirteen through sixteen. The verse is one more time. 
1 Timothy 4, 13 through 16. Until I come, this is the NIV, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, mm -hmm. to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So that was a sobering message. <laughs> that was a sobering message. That meant that I had to keep my stuff together. One more time. Yes. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Yeah, I had to keep my stuff together. I couldn't, I couldn't veer, I couldn't go off the rails. I had to, I had to keep it together. But God, right? I could, I could become unhinged before him. I could, I could let it all out. I could cry, I could scream, I could rip the sink <laughs> in sheer terror. Because I knew that in those places, God would be the one to get me through this. There would be times that where I would call people, no one would be available. So guess what? I wasn't supposed to talk to anybody else but God. Amen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was through that. Next slide, please. It was after that. <laughs> that stuff started to really start to get weird around my house. The leaves started falling off my trees. There were two trees in my front yard. They started to fall off with a quickness. Like two thirds of the leaves just fell off the tree. And they weren't even brown. They were just falling off the tree. And I looked at Elijah one day, we were both coming home at the same time, and I said, are you seeing this? Because am I crazy, or do you see all the leaves on the, on the ground? He says, yeah, I'm wondering what's going on. I'm in a panic. I'm calling the landlord. I'm like, you need to get over here and you need to get to your trees. <laughs> Something's going on. Poltergeist. <laughs> so, so finally, um, so this was this was the middle of July, right as God had given me that scripture, right? No joke. And then July 28th, this happened. Next slide, please. This is my basil plant that Elijah had neglected while I was in Ireland. And a lot of it had turned brown. However, it was blooming out of the brown spots, out of the brown stalks. Not only blooming with new leaves, but with flowers. So at the same time that I saw this, the Lord said, go, go look at the trees in the front yard. And I had just, for whatever reason, I just hadn't paid attention. I was just all up in my business. But I went to see the, the front trees, and not only were they green, all over again with new leaves, but they were coming in fuller than they had before. I'm like, okay, Lord, what you doing? <laughs> What's going on? But I didn't stop there. He kept doing this. He kept, he kept filling me with his promises. Isaiah 43, 19. Mary, could you read that one? And it talks, it, this one talks about how he's doing a new thing. 4319. Yes. Isaiah 4319. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. This is what he gave me when he told me to go look at the trees. There was no mistake what he was trying to convey to me. And so I, I continued to hold on. Amen? There were other words of prophecies that were released over me. Um, one of them was <clears throat> when I had gone to, um, when I had gone to join a worship team. Um, 
that one of my friends was was over, and he was the worship director in this one particular church, and it was it was a healing process for me. It was I was able to actually get a lot of healing through this worship, because it's, worship to me cuts really deep, and and it brings and it brings stuff in from God that you just can't get any other way. And so that was, that was one of the things that I did. <clears throat> so one of the words of, of prophecy that was released over me there was he has removed, um, was that he would fill all the holes, remove my depression so as not to hinder my anointing, and that I would want for nothing. And those things have truly happened. Also, the Lord um, told me that he had removed my husband so that I can step into his will and purpose and that my husband is whole now. So not only did he take away my husband from me, but he gave him a wholeness that I could never give him. He gave him the healing that I could never bring. Amen. Amen. And he also said to me, the Lord also said that he's restoring me to his original plan and design. Psalm 62 one and two is a very powerful verse that the Lord also brought to my attention. Psalm 62, one and two. Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Amen. Amen. So those were, those were nuggets of goodness that God just kept giving me. Amen. Next slide, please. He also, the Lord also put a trainer in my path. Um, so when I went back to the gym, it was very painful for me because I would look across the way and usually if I was on the stair stepper, Lester would be on the, uh, the bike, the stationary bike, and we would make faces at each other. <laughs> of course we would. And so as I was on the, the stair stepper, I was looking over to an empty bike or to a bike that somebody else was sitting on. So it was very painful for me and I was, getting stuck in a rut. And this, this, physical, this physical fitness had a purpose to it. Not only was it, was it keeping me from going back into fatness, but it was also keeping me from going into depression because if I was able to get my, my endorphins going. I was able to continue to move and do the things and stay active the way that God had intended me to do. He was really bringing me back to my original, the original plan that he had for me. Go ahead and, and give me the next one. So I started hiking um, with this trainer. I started working out with this trainer. And we, <clears throat> we had moved to another gym to start to train because I was able to go and do hikes with him outside of the gym, which is good because my coordination is horrible. It's just hideous. So for me to be on a trail and to actually walk or run a trail is a big deal. <laughs> and to keep my feet, you know, from slipping or going off to the side. So I was able to do that with this trainer. And there's other trainers that were in there at the same time and, and they were joking with each other and as, as my trainer was sitting up the next exercise for me to do, he was joking with the other trainer that he was training me how to do Spartan races, but I just didn't know it. <laughs> I was like, that's not funny. <laughs> so, but all in all, this helped me to stay on my physical course that God had wanted me to be on in the first place. Amen. Next, next please. And he also allowed me to travel. God allowed me to travel. He opened up doors so that I could do more traveling. That was something that, gosh, I loved to do when I was in my 20s. And I did a lot of it when I was in my 20s. And I loved it. But being married, when you have a lot of commitments, financial commitments, you can't do that. God opened up doors so that I was able to do that. Next slide, please. And then the next one. So as 2019 comes upon us, Margaret's daughter had a word for me, and it was regrowth, and it totally fit in to everything that God was doing. She didn't know all the story that was going on with me. She didn't know about the tree. She didn't know about the blossom. She didn't know about any of this. 
but God gave him a word, and it was regrowth. And he regrew everything. And what he was doing was he told me that he would use the remnants of what I had gone through to be the fertilizer, to be that nourishment for the roots of what's to come. Amen. So in January, after this, at the end of January, I did my first Spartan race. And I want to let you know, it's no picnic. This was only a three-mile course, and I'd say about 18 to 20 obstacles that I had to do. And a lot of times I had to be pushed up or <laughs> assisted in some way. Next, please. And, but I was blessed that I was able to do that because this was the physical manifestation every obstacle that I had to endure and overcome to this point. But God. Amen. Amen. And even though I had, I had finished this, this was probably one of the one of the loneliest times. Because I, would, I was just wondering how happy my husband would have been for me to have accomplished this goal. But I only knew that I could do it. The only way that I could do it was because he wasn't there. Because we did everything together. And he would never be able to do that. But God. So, through this process and through up to now, God has been doing nothing but giving me love notes. What I call love notes. This was a leaf. Margaret gets jealous about this one. This was a leaf <laughs> that had fallen behind my car at the gym. And that may not mean anything to anybody else, but God knows how I love fall. He knows how I love the autumn season. It's one of my favorites. And growing up on the East Coast, it's in upstate New York, it's big. It's a big deal. And you smell fall. It has a smell all its own. Yeah. And so I had come around my car in a way that I usually don't, and that leaf totally caught my eye. It was so perfectly placed behind my car. And I looked up at the tree that I came from, and all the rest of the leaves were green. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. That was one of his love notes. Next one. This one was um, one of the flowers. Okay, so this was a succulent plant that I had neglected hardly. And I am not a green thumb, and I am so sorry. Um, but, but plants come to me to die, usually. <laughs> so, it's just one of those things, unfortunately. And I had gone to the, to the doctor, back to the doctor that Lester had gone to. It was a family doctor, and so, this was the end of this April, and this was the first time that they had seen me since my husband had passed. They knew, because I had called them when I, once I got back from Ireland about what had happened to him. But this was the first time that they had the chance to talk to me and set eyes on me. And they let me through, go through the, the waves of grief that were happening, and there were a lot. And they were constantly checking in with me, how are you doing? Um, because at, at the beginning, when I was first coming home from Ireland, I was going through anxiety attacks. Never dealt with that before. Didn't know what, that, what the heck was this. This is a whole different animal that I don't know anything about. And it was scary, but God got me through that as well. You know, and I was able to navigate through that. So they asked me, do you need anything for anxiety? I'm like, no, no, no. Well, what do you do? Well, I breathe deep. I call on Jesus and I pray. He says, and does that work? I said, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here with you now. And you, and you usually would have him behind the wheel. So, um, you know, thank God for that. But I was able to get through that appointment, and I came home. And this poor plant. This poor, poor, poor plant. Thank God I had a lot of rain this season. Is it a caliandra? <laughs> it's a what? Is it a caliandra? She doesn't know. I have no idea. <laughs> so if you can get me that. a fuchsia flowers? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Caliandra. Caliandra. Thank you. You all that. So I'm a member of Caliandra. 
It's a beautiful flower. So I would come home, I came home from that appointment and I was I felt so sad, so alone. But God, He gave me a beautiful flower to greet me when I got back because it wasn't there that morning. Um, I promise you that. Okay. It wasn't there that morning. So he, he just leaves all kinds of little love love notes for me. And this one is one of my favorites. Go ahead. This one was um, I had gone up to to the uh, safari park. And it was something that I had been wanting to do. And Lester had done it with me before. And I really just wanted to get back there. I, I just I love butterflies. And I just, I just wanted to be there. But God, at one point he had four but butterflies land on me, all with their with their wings open. It was just absolutely beautiful. But I was able I was able to do that. Butterflies are what usually a, a symbolism of, of a new coming out of something, coming out of something horrible, a new life springing. Amen. So the things that I've learned through my process, God's the only one that can save me. He is the only one that can save me, and Family is important. Family is so, so very important. And these, these boys have just been amazing and such a blessing to me. And intimacy and, and relationship with God, this is actually Psalms 91, verse 14. Um, but intimacy and relationship with God is the most satisfying experience of my life. If I was to go through this again, I would not be able to go through it without him. I've done it the other way. Trust me, it doesn't work. It does not work without God. And it's not about religion. It's all about the relationship that you have with him. Drawing on that intimacy, getting before him. There are times when, one of my favorite worship times is to do that when I'm cooking. I put worship music on and I start to cook. There was one time when I had knives in my hand and I'm just <laughs> bowing down in the kitchen because the, the just the sheer honor of being in God's presence. Amen. Amen. Yeah. But that's what it's all about. It's about being vulnerable before Him. And whatever He removes, God will replace with something greater. Amen. Amen. So now, I do vulnerable. <laughs>